Hey everyone, my name is Royce and I'm a first year MD-PhD student at UPenn. In this video, I'm going to be going over my entire AMCAS application. So this is my application that got me accepted to my dream MD-PhD program, that is the MD-PhD program at UPenn. And I hope that by seeing this video, you can see what it takes to be a competitive MD or MD-PhD applicant at a school like UPenn. And throughout the video, I'm also going to be providing some tips that you can follow that I hope you find helpful. So. Let's get started. I have my AMCAS application on my iPad here, and I'm just gonna go through, you know, step by step, top to bottom, all the things on my application. So first I just wanna address some common misconceptions. You absolutely do not need to get five nature or science first author publications. You definitely don't need like a 4.9 GPA or 530 on the MCAT to be competitive at a top MD PhD program. And I'm sure a lot of students here at Penn do have insane stats, but it's definitely not required. So the first thing I wanna cover is my GPA. I went to Washington University in St. Louis as an undergrad, and I ended up applying straight through. And I, at that point, had you know three years worth of coursework and three years worth of research. Um, so according to the AMCAS, my cumulative undergrad GPA was a 3.94. My BCPM GPA, which is essentially my science GPA, is 3.92. And my AO GPA was a 4.0. So my total GPA was a 3.94, and I had 112 total credit hours of classes by the time I applied. So 112 total credit hours divided by six semesters is 19 credit hours per semester. I double majored, so I had two majors. The first one was in physics, and uh, specifically I was on the biophysics track. How it worked at WashU was that I had, you know, the general physics major, so I would take, you know, all the required classes for the physics major, and then I did an optional track for the physics major. This was the biophysics track. So this required a few extra courses, uh, specifically in biophysics. And my second major was in chemistry. I ended up picking both physics and chemistry as my majors because you know, I thought that they would give me a great fundamental understanding of the physical sciences um, and that complemented well with my engineering focused research. So I chose these two degrees because I thought it would give me a nice foundational base uh, for my future graduate studies, which I knew would be in a very specific, you know, very narrow research topic. In hindsight, I think it was probably unnecessary for me to take such difficult courses. Um, and in my experience, I've seen that, you know, with my peers, my friends, who you know told me about their applications that um, you know even if you're taking easier classes but you have a higher GPA, I really think that to medical schools uh, looks better. So if your primary goal is to get into the best possible medical school that you can, then I would recommend you know don't try to like you know take all these crazy majors and take all these crazy classes. Just try to do something that you feel comfortable with that's not pushing you too hard because um, you know even if you take you know more rigorous courses. Um, but you end up doing worse in terms of your GPA, um, I think medical schools will, you know, discount that more than if you just took easier classes and got a 4.0. Uh, that's just my two cents, but it probably doesn't matter as long as your GPA meets a certain threshold. Now let's talk about my MCAT score. I ended up scoring a 521 on my MCAT. This was a 99th percentile. My score breakdown was a 132 in physics and chemistry, uh, 129 in the CARS reading section, and a 130 in biology, and a 130 in psychology and sociology. To provide some context, I took the MCAT in March. So I applied in June of uh, 2019. So I took the MCAT in March of 2019. And in hindsight, I probably should have taken it uh, earlier, just for my peace of mind, just because you know that spring semester before you apply can be very hectic and very stressful. So really with the MCAT, you just want to know your score before you end up applying, because obviously, you know, what you score in the MCAT restricts what your school list will look like. Uh, so anytime, you know, April or earlier, I think is fine. So just a quick note on the MCAT and the GPA. For the purpose of med school applications, um, these two numbers just have to be high enough for a given school. At a place like UPenn, uh, if your GPA is above like a 385 and your MCAT's above like a 520, you're fine. I just made up those numbers. I'm not really sure what exactly the numbers are. So as long as you can meet these thresholds, you can get your foot in the door with the admissions committee. I think functionally, uh, 521 versus a 525, uh, there probably is not a huge difference in the eyes of the admissions committee. 
So now let's switch gears a little bit and talk about my activities section. So I'm gonna go down the list here and talk about all my activities in no particular order. So one of my activities was research, you know, obviously as an MD PhD applicant. So I ended up staying in the same lab over the course of my four years at WashU. This lab did research in uh, applied physics. So this was, you know, working on optical devices, photonic devices, and using them and manipulating them for biomedical applications. So I focused more on the engineering side of things. So that included, you know, device fabrication, data processing. By the time I applied, that is from my freshman year until the end of my junior year, I ended up racking up a total of 2,900 hours of research in this one research lab. And this total comes from me doing like 15 to 20 hours of research uh, every week throughout the school years and sometimes over breaks, so like summer break for example. So the next activity section in the MCAS for me was my publications. So I ended up getting a few publications throughout my undergrad and this also included a first author paper in a peer-reviewed journal. And in my opinion, this was the most important aspect of my application in the eyes of the MD-PhD committee. That's because, you know, this is really the culmination of all my, you know, work as an independent researcher, as a maturing scientist. So I just want to make a, you know, little note here that you definitely do not need to have a publication uh, to get into an MD-PhD program. So there are friends of mine who have gotten into top MD-PhD programs, Penn included, who got in without any publication at all. So some didn't have any publications at all. Some had a publication that was in the works, you know, under review and didn't get published until they actually got into the program. So pretty much all I want to say is that, you know, you don't need a publication to get into an MD-PhD program, even a top one, as crazy as that sounds. So the next activity of mine was research presentations and research posters. They included, you know, oral presentations where, you know, I had a PowerPoint clicker and I presented a PowerPoint or uh, poster presentations as a part of a large symposium and I had my own little poster and people would just you know walk by and I would you know give them like a sales pitch of my research. These presentations were at the campus level so I would do like you know WashU undergrad uh, research symposiums. I also had conferences at the local level so these are conferences that included uh, you know a number of Midwest schools. I also gave presentations at national conferences so these are conferences at places like DC or Baltimore for example and there would be research specialists from across the U.S. who would flock to these conferences. And I also presented at an international conference, which was super cool. So I went to uh, Okinawa, Japan, and I was able to meet a lot of really cool researchers in my field, you know, from places like Germany or Australia. Uh, and I was able to experience a totally new, you know, country and a totally new culture um, and a whole lot of, you know, great food. So my opinion about conferences is that if you're looking to apply MD, PhD, or even if you're looking to apply MD only, uh, I think that conferences are a really great way to show your progress as a researcher. They're you know, very tangible things that you know, aren't quite at the level of a research paper you know, publication. The benefit of that is that you can get more presentations at conferences than you can papers. And overall, I think it's a great way to boost your resume and your CV for when you apply to medical school. So the next few things on my AMCAS were extracurricular clubs that I did as an undergrad. Uh, so I ended up doing, you know, three or four clubs as an undergrad. I didn't do a crazy number. So these were clubs that I was really passionate about. So for example, I, um, oh, one sec, let me turn on the light actually. Okay, much better. Um, so for example, I was part of a physics club and in that I was able to, you know, come up with you know, new majors for the physics department, and that was really cool. And we would also do fun stuff like liquid nitrogen ice cream events or uh, stargazing events. Um, other clubs I did, for example, there was um, a chemistry tournament club, and so I was able to, uh, you know, be a part of this really special event where we can, you know, help run a chemistry tournament for underserved high school students. Um, so this was a great opportunity for us to organize the event, to write questions for the event, you know, organize the logistics, um, do outreach and, and get you know local schools in St. Louis and also other high schools across the US involved um, It was overall a really fun process too, and I also like to play the violin So I was able to join the WashU Symphony Orchestra and I also joined a club where we played music for patients uh, At the WashU Academic Hospital. So let's see what else I did um, So in terms of clinical activities, I did around uh, 60 hours of shadowing by the time I applied and this included shadowing a geriatrician, which I talked about in my personal statement. Um, this also included a neurologist and also an interventional radiologist 
uh, at WashU School of Medicine. And in terms of clinical volunteering, I had around 200 hours by the time I applied. And most of this was as a patient advocate at a cancer outpatient clinic. This was a really great experience for me because I was able to interact with patients in a very intimate way in a clinical setting. My opinion is that if you're applying MD-PhD, treat these clinical experiences as a way for you to learn if medicine is right for you. And of course, this applies to MD applicants as well. If you're applying MD-PhD, try to aim for around 50 hours of shadowing and maybe around 100 hours of clinical volunteering. I'm giving you these numbers as a way to uh, you know, get a tangible sense for what you should aim for, but of course these are just rules of thumb. And if you're applying MD, you know, try to get more clinical hours. So for example, you could try to aim for a few hundred uh, clinical volunteering hours, maybe two or three hundred hours of clinical volunteering, because that plays a bigger role in your application as an MD applicant. And ideally, by the end of your clinical experiences, you should be able to speak to the things that you learned about. Uh, and this will probably be in your personal statement. So if you want to see how I articulated my thoughts on my clinical experiences, please check out my video of me reading my personal statement. The link will pop up in this corner. So the next AMCAS activity for me was being a tutor and teaching assistant. I was a teaching assistant for organic chemistry and I was also a teaching assistant for introductory physics. These were very instructive experiences for me because I was able to you know, really reinforce uh, the introductory knowledge of physics and organic chemistry in a way I hadn't before. I also did some private tutoring for WashU students who were taking intro bio over the summer. So this allowed me to make money on the side while also practicing tutoring and mentorship, which I also really enjoyed. Now let's go on to my final AMCAS activity, which was honors, awards, and recognitions. In my junior year, I ended up getting a national, really prestigious, named scholarship. And I think this was a really big boost to my application. I also got uh, some other national scholarships for research in optics and photonics in particular. Over the summer, I got research fellowships from WashU through the physics department, through other departments. And also when I went to conferences, I would look to see if they had any travel awards available for students, especially undergrad students. This was a great way for me to you know, save funding for my PI or chemistry department or physics department uh, for needing to fund for my uh, travels. And it also provided a boost to my resume and CV. So in my opinion, you probably don't need any awards at all kind of like publications, like they're nice to have, but they're not necessary at all. So my opinion is that you probably don't need any awards, let alone national ones, uh, in order to be competitive at MD or MD-PhD programs. Of course it helps, but it's not a requirement. So kind of like how I said that research conferences are like a step below you know, actual publications and peer-reviewed journals, similarly, I think travel awards are a step below national you know, named scholarships. But I still think they're really great ways for you to boost your CV and boost your application to medical school. So the final activity I listed in my AMCAS application was hobbies. I played pickup basketball with my friends at the University Recreation Center throughout my undergrad. In my AMCAS, I said I played on average four hours per week year round since my freshman year. And this totaled to roughly 520 hours. And honestly, this number was a bit of an underestimation. You know, sometimes I'd play basketball for three hours at a time and I would do it, you know, three or four times a week. So my opinion about hobbies is that you should definitely list them uh, if they're a big part of your life, especially since there is you know, a category called hobbies in the AMCAS activities section. So they give you the option and my recommendation is to put it if it really is a big part of your life. For me it was and I felt very comfortable putting it down. So that's basically it for my activity section. So now I'm gonna talk about my essays very briefly. So I've already shared my personal statement on YouTube. Uh, link will pop up in the corner. Um, hope you find that helpful. Uh, so I guess I can summarize my MD-PhD essay um, so basically I just talked about how um, you know, I really liked astrophysics as a kid and I paralleled that interest in astrophysics with um, you know, a really cool like, thing I saw under the microscope uh, in lab and how this particle moving through solution kind of looked like a planet. I drew this parallel to show that you know, it wasn't just astrophysics in general that uh, you know, ignited my interest, but it was science more broadly and the process of discovery that I was really passionate about. And also, you know, listed some reasons why I think the MD-PhD would help me in the future as, you know, a bioengineering PhD, and how specifically getting the MD, you know, would aid me not only in my research, but also clinically, obviously, just, you know, being able to see patients uh, was so important to me. The third and final essay I had to write for the AMCAS primary was my Significant Research Experiences essay. This is just a brief summary of all my research projects uh, in the one lab that I worked in, uh, and it just covered all the technical details. So there's a lot of technical language that's you know not interesting, and that's all I'm gonna say about that. So the very final thing on my AMCAS application 
is the schools I applied to. And I've already made a video on the schools I applied to, uh, the schools I interviewed at. Um, in summary, I had uh, 25 schools I applied to with my MCAS primary. I wrote secondaries for 22 of the schools and I got interviews from I think eight schools total. Um, and eventually that culminated in three medical school acceptances. Um, and so I think that's basically it for my MCAS application. Uh, and I hope you found the application itself to be interesting and I hope you found my advice to be particularly interesting in terms of you know what you should be aiming for uh, you know as an undergrad and what really it takes to be competitive at a program like the MD PhD program at UPenn. If you found this video helpful, please like and subscribe. Thanks and I'll see you later.